First on. These are Pinewood Film Studios, where J. Arthur Rank and Lady Yule backed their fancy before the war. He was a corn miller and a Yorkshire Methodist. She was a banker's wife and a racehorse owner. Between them, they're the founding father and mother of the modern British film. The first film made at Pinewood was Pygmalion, with Wendy Hiller and Leslie Howard. A young man called David Lean edited it. Anthony Asquith directed it. You know it better as My Fair Lady. Since then, there had been Oliver Twist, The Red Shoes, all the James Bond films, and hundreds of others by British. My name is Michael Powell. I'm a film director. This is my life. In 1921, yes, 57 years ago, when I was still at school, I read my first fan magazine. And in it, there was an article about movie making. I fell in love right away. This was for me. In 1931, I directed my first film. It was a thriller. That same year, I read in the newspaper about the population of St Kilda, a lonely island in the Scottish Hebrides. They'd asked to be taken off the island because the young people were all going away and there were no children at the village school. I thought one day I would make a film of this. One day. In 1936, I led an expedition to the island of Fula in the Shetland Islands to make the film. Fula was an inhabited island, and the leading part was played by John Lorry. In 1978, I took John Lorry and myself and a crew back to Fula to see the places and the people that had meant so much to us when we were all very much younger. I call this new film, Return to the Edge of the World. This is Fula, westernmost of the Shetland Isles. Latitude 60 degrees as far north as the southern tip of Greenland. 800 miles north of Piccadilly Circus. Nothing between us and the North American continent but the Atlantic Ocean. The edge of the world. This is the Came, the highest sea cliff in Great Britain. 1,220 feet from sky to sea. This was where a young film director called Michael Powell brought us in 1936 to make a film about the death of an island. It started out just a film, but it became an experience that changed all our lives. The Shetland Islanders are proud of their descent from the old Viking rovers. We are not Scottish, we're Norse, they tell me. <laughs> the name Fula is Norse, the island of birds.
Fula is the breeding ground of the great skewer. Vonksy, the locals call him. <laughs> and the bumps on the head he'll give you in the breeding season. So watch out. Forty-two years ago, we landed on Fula around midnight, after six hours at sea in an open motorboat. Today, Fula has an airstrip, and we fly in in 15 minutes. In 1936, the whole population of the island acted in our film. Today, there are only six of our original company left, and still living on the island. But the same families are still steadfast, the same names, Gears, Greys, Eisbisters, Mansons, Holborns, Ratters. They're all here to greet us. With me are a camera and sound crew. Sidney Streeter, who was chief of construction on the original film and is now co-producer. Hamish Sutherland, who played the young minister and he's brought his wife Joan with him. My wife Frankie, who appeared in the opening sequences of the film with me. And of course, the one and only John Laurie. Edith, you were a bonny lassie, and now you're a bonny woman. <laughs> I'm so. You remember me? I do remember you. Jimmy Gray. It is Jimmy Gray. Oh, Jimmy, how nice man. And uh, here's Robbie. My so it mate. is Robbie, and you're an eyes whistler. Eyes Of course That's he right. is, with a face like that. What else could he be? Eh? And who's this? That's my son. Of course there's another eyes whistler now, as there never was. How do you do, sir? What's your name? Eric. Eric. Ah, oh, Eric. <laughs> oh, you're grand. You're a visitor. Yeah, I'm, a visitor. I'm sure you are. Ah, now there's a real full of face. Like your name, dear? My McGear. My McGear, yes. I'm thinking back. My McGear it is. Hamish, Hamish, we're coming to you. <laughs> yeah. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. And here is our walk. Of course, I remember Roddy, yes. <laughs> now, here I'm behaving like an Englishman. <laughs> I brought my bush with me because it's my ambition to climb the cave while I'm here. I climbed, climbed it so many times when we were here previously that I insist on climbing it again. Oh, That's yes. We'll Clear the runway, then. people, please. Clear the runway now. Fuller again. At long last. Oh, over oh, the way, I'm, I'm John Lowry. You may be seen me around. After all, I've been acting for 57 of my 81 years. <laughs> Hamlet, Stratford and Avon. Got the croft out of Hitchcock's 39 steps. Private Fraser and Dad's army, and of course, Peter Manson and Michael Powell's The Edge of the World. There were two families in Michael's story, the Mansons and the Greys, your lot. Now, I was the head of one, Finlay Curry was the head of the other. Finlay was in his 60s, and so when it came to the film test, I, uh, I overdid the age in a wee bit. Michael took one look at me and says, Beat in the snowstorm, John, away we and wash it off. <laughs> and now, look at me, Eric, just right for the part, man. Don't tell anyone, I'm a poet. A poet is not without honour, save in his own country. And I suppose that's why most of my big chances were given me by Hungarians or Americans. This one, The Edge of the World, was given me by Joe Rock, an American ex vaudeville comedian who was making pictures at Elstree. He was financed by a North Country showman called Isles, who was crazy about brass bands. These two, 
Joe Rock and Isles, the vaudeville comedian and the brass band enthusiast, gave me the money to make The Edge of the World. When the film was shown in London, it didn't exactly set the Thames on fire, but we got a print to New York, and the New York critics chose it as one of the best foreign films of the year. That got me a contract with Corder, and that led to The Thief of Baghdad, The Spy in Black, The Lion Has Wings, and when I was in Canada making 49th Parallel, six of my Fuller brothers were with me. Do you remember, Michael, how you and I made our approach to those Fuller cliffs from the landward side? <laughs> how we crawled forward on our hands and knees and looked fearfully down at the gannets plummeting into the sea way below. And yet, Within a week or so, <laughs> you and the camera crew were scrambling about on the ledges like mountain goats. And I was carrying on my shoulders a lamb struggling and bawling and kicking like a mad thing. Hey, <laughs> man, man. Those were the golden days, Michael. It's spring here, down north, <laughs> the time of the white nights, and the long days, and the flowers. <laughs> Just 42 years since we yacht with Michael, Frankie, and Niall McGuinness on board. Dropped anchor down there in the wee harbor. We started our film. Let's call the roll, Hamish. Thurster Grays played by Finlay Curry, Niall McGuinness. A Finlay, a rare old trooper. <laughs> he was acting in a film at the age of 93 when he died. Niall, a bonny lad, with the music of Dublin in his voice. He died young. Well, I'll speak for the Mansons, and first and foremost for John Laurie, who led our little wee band of actors and played Peter. He made the part his own. And Belle Crystal, who played Ruth. And Eric Berry, who's now on tour in America, playing in San Francisco. But he remembers Fula and its cliffs. And Kitty Kerwin, a grand old Irish actress. Aye, and here's to Hamish Sutherland, our young catechist. I believe he'd have made a name for himself as an actor if it hadn't been for the war. And he tells me he's a retired businessman, but his wife says a Scotsman never retires. Well... <laughs> And here's to all the men, women, and children of Fula who helped to make a film in 1936. I know their face is fine, the audience, but the mind's gone a bit, so excuse it. 
Zidith and Jimmy Gray, Maima and Harry Gear, Aggie Jean and Bobby Eisvistak, and some others that were a wee bit frail and couldn't quite make the hell. God bless them all. And I'll speak for Sydney Streeter, Chief of Construction, Chief Carpenter, Chief Engineer, and Chief Dancer in the Fuller Reel. <laughs> I'll speak for the technicians. Ernest Palmer, Chief Cameraman, his camera operator, Skeets Kelly, he was killed in an air crash whilst filming the Blue Max. Trigillis, sound recordist. Vernon Sewell, the skipper of the Vidra, our supply ship. For John Seaborn, he edited most of Michael's pictures up to that time. John was loved by everybody and he loved everybody. A great man. I am sorry about Skeets. I am very sorry he is not here today. I was what they call the camera grip when the film unit was on Fuller in 1936. And I am now camera grip again with Brian in 1978. I must be good before Mr. Powell came all the way back to Fuller to hire me for the same job again. Now, oh, Jim, did the making of this film bring about any lasting and beneficial effect to the island? Oh, yes. One thing was the publicity that the island got. It's well known virtually over the whole world now. And then another thing was the radio telephone that we got in full of a year after the film was made. There's no doubt that one was the result of the other. And uh, to illustrate the sort of publicity that, I mean, how well known the island is now, a few years ago, we had a bad food shortage in the wintertime. And I was quoted in some of the newspapers which were reprinted in America. And I got a letter from America addressed to Jim Gear, Fuller, somewhere in the North Sea, 60 miles west of Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> were there any bad effects? Well, one unfortunate effect was that in the official mind, having seen a film about the evacuation of St Kilda, made in Fuller, they then were foolish enough to think that Fuller was the next island to be evacuated. And since then, it's been used as an excuse for not putting in services to Fuller that had badly needed improvements to the harbour, water schemes, electricity, the things we expect in the world of 1970. And uh, they say, oh, well, you're going to be evacuated in a few years, which, of course, is complete nonsense. The most wonderful part of our story is to come. Our film showed a defeated population leaving their homes because there was no jobs for the young men and women. In those days, the Shetlands meant wool and fish and ponies and the best deep-sea fishermen in the world. But in 1978, Shetland and her islands mean North Sea oil.
It was Thomas Carlyle that said it. The age of miracles is past now. The age of miracles is forever here. father likes to make his own fiddles. He made the top from seasoned pine, which was part of his old school desk, and the sides from beech, driftwood cast up on the rocks. 